or a symbolic picture of uh, the glorified end time sovereign and king. And so then when you move out of chapter one from that vision of the glorified Christ into chapter two uh, and three and his messages to the churches, they're more like, they're in the form more of like royal pronouncements rather than letters. Anyway, uh, the whole point of that uh, is this is, um, you know, this, this isn't just pen pal writing here in chapters two and three. This is the king delivering pronouncements to the churches that he is uh, walking amongst and looking over and caring for and shepherding. Um, and let me take you to a passage. I forgot to include that in the, in the notes. But let me take you to a passage that we looked at in when we went through 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4. Um, and to me, the, ans the, the, the question that this passage in 1 Peter 4 answers is why did, did the, the glorified king and judge before he, before we go to the throne room and we see him judge the world through the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments and bring and, and return in chapter 19 and 20 and judge the world. Before he does that, he turns to his churches in chapter two and three and gives these royal pronouncements to the churches. Why did he do that? Why does he, why does he do it that way? Uh, well, we're not told, but I do think um, that in in uh, First Peter, I'm in First John. It wasn't going to work. In First Peter, chapter four, verses um, well, the verse I'm I'm looking for is uh, verse seventeen, but I'm going to read verses sixteen through nineteen, and I want you to see how how very appropriate this is and how it probably explains while before he gets into the rest of the vision in the book of Revelation, he stops and gives these seven pronouncements uh, to all the churches, these, these, these royal pronouncements to all the churches, it, starting in verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And so uh, after we move out of chapters two and three, we're going to move into the throne room in chapters four and five. And chapters four through 16 is one vision, one huge section. And what we see is the lamb that was slain um, implementing judgment on the world for their disobedience to the gospel. But before he does that, he stops and he gives these royal pronouncement, pronouncements to his churches. And I think it's because of this very principle that we see in 1 Peter 4, 17, that judgment begins at the household of God. Now, that is not, that is not uh, when he says judgment, that is not condemning judgment. That is purifying judgment that he's talking about there in verse 17. 
And obviously it's not purifying judgment when it comes to those who disobey the gospel. Uh, that's condemning final judgment. But what I want you to see is um, before he turns to op begin opening the scroll, he stops and addresses his churches. We are um, expected to be faithful to him, to be faithful witnesses. And, um, and we're going to see that as we move through these seven churches. But I, I just wanted to point that out, that it's very appropriate that, um, that he stops and he gives these royal pronouncements to his churches. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll see more about those pronouncements when we get into them. But uh, I'm sure uh, the many times that you've read through Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, you see that these messages to the seven churches, even though they vary in length and, and somewhat in content, all seven of them follow fairly consistently a, a certain pattern. There are certain elements that are in all of these messages. And I've got them listed out there for you. Um, uh, the first element we see is uh, to the angel of the church in, and then you fill in the place name in this first message that we read, Ephesus. He, he says to the angel of the church in, blank, right. That's in all seven of them. Uh, and then uh, the second element that we see is thus says, and that's just a summary of the phrase that John normally uses is the words of. That's why I've got it in quotes, but it's, but essentially it's thus says he who, and then what follows is a description that's drawn from the, re the vision in chapter one. So this, this glorified king is addressing his churches, making these pronouncements. And in each one of these messages, he takes part of the vision in chapter one and relates it uh, uh, and, and uses that to describe himself in his message addressed to that church. Uh, and, and we'll see how um, the, the portion of the vision that he selects uh, each time corresponds to what he has to say in that message to that church. And, and when I say that message to that church, always remember here, as we're reading through here, he addresses the individual churches specifically, but not privately. He does it public, and he makes it very clear at the end that what he says specifically to that individual church, he's saying to all the churches, okay? All right, then that third element, I know your, and then fill in the blank, situation, character, actions. And then he says, at least to five of them, but I have this against you. And, um, there's this, uh, and then the next one, the next feature, number five, is then uh, following what he has against them, he has this command, he includes this command to repent. And then we have those last two elements, very familiar. Uh, number six is repeated uh, almost verbatim in every single uh, message. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then there comes a promise to those who conquer. Now, it's interesting that he, he calls them to conquer. Um, look, I think it is in chapter 12. Yes, verse 11. Revelation. Of Revelation, sorry. Yes, good question. Um, in chapter 12, when we get to that, we're going to see uh, that it's a description 
of the warfare that the dragon is raging on the people of God. But um, notice in verse 11, um, and they, that is um, uh, the, the believers that are being accused uh, day and night by the dragon, and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. So they conquered the devil. They were conquerors through the blood of the lamb, first and foremost. And secondly, by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. In other words, they remain faithful witnesses of the gospel to those around them, even when it costs them everything. So through the blood of the lamb and through their faithfulness, they conquered. So um, we're, that's we're, it's going to be interesting to see as we go through these messages, the various things that he calls each of these churches to conquer. But I want you to know that the bottom line in all of it is to remain faithful. You're doing, you're facing this, you're doing this. I want you to remain faithful. That's the way you're going to conquer. And we're going to talk about the, and, and there's a promise to the conqueror. And uh, I, well, uh, we'll, uh, we'll start seeing that next week. I'll, I'll hold off comments on that until we get into the message to Ephesus and Smyrna next week. Um, um, what the promise is, but uh, it's very interesting when you line up the promises to all seven churches and look at what those promises are, um, what it points to, and, and we will do that. It's a composite picture of one promise that's made to all believers. Um, um, but anyway, so that's kind of the form each of these messages take. Um, and again, I mean, the first question is, why is he uh, writing to the angel of the church? And uh, do you remember what we said last week the angel represents? Well, we said that the angel is a real angel, right? A heavenly angel. And why, what, why would he be writing the angel? since angels aren't members in a church or pastors of a church or anything like that. How does God use angels in the life of the church? They're like messengers, aren't they? Messengers, and yes, Julie said they're like messengers. Yes, they're messengers as well as uh, uh, an even broader description of them would be found in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. They are ministering spirits to the elect. So God uses angels to, to uh, mediate his, his care uh, and protection to uh, his people. And remember, Revelation is a book that's telling us what in the world is going on right now only from heaven's perspective, not from our earthly perspective. We see it from uh, an earthly perspective. Uh, what we see in Revelation is what is going on from a heavenly perspective. So it's not surprising that he includes these angels as ministering spirits. So he's He's writing to um, uh, the spirits, I mean, to the angel of each church, the angel that's associated with that, that church or that he has dispatched uh, at that time um, uh, to aid, come to the aid of that church. Anyway, 
Okay, so uh, we're not going to go through this neat little table I've drawn up for you, but uh, you might want to look at it from time to time as you're studying because it's a it's a good little summary. Um, it's a way of comparing. You look if if you look at the top row, you see all seven churches. Okay. If you look at the side column there, you see all seven of those elements that we talked about that's in each message. And then filling in the boxes is just the verses where that occurs for each one of them. But you can see a pattern. You can see patterns here. For instance, go down on the side column, go down to where it says approval. And there are two churches that the box is blank, right? Sardis and Laodicea. All the other five churches um, um, have comments. The messages have comments of approval or commendation from Christ. Look down to uh, the one called call to repent, threat of judgment. If you look across there, you see there's two blanks. There's two churches that were, uh, well, correction. Actually, if you look at correction right under approval and call to repent, threat of judgment, uh, two times, both of those are blank. Two churches receive no correction and no call to repent. Those churches are Smyrna in Philadelphia. So we can, so up at the top of your notes in that first paragraph, I wrote uh, comparing the different messages, and then I refer you to the table below. We find three groups of churches in these, uh, in these uh, seven messages. One, three churches which receive both commendation and rebuke. Ephesus, Pergamum, Thyatira. And then the second group are two churches which received only commendation, Smyrna and Philadelphia. And then the third group of churches are two churches which received only rebuke, Sardis and Laodicea. So here's, here's an important issue that I wanted to highlight and for us to uh, uh, give some thought to. Of the seven churches, only two of them have no conflicts or hostilities, external or internal. I should have added the word reported. <laughs> I don't know what I did. Why I didn't? Um, do you have it? In, do you have the word reported in yours? Yeah, it should say of the seven churches, only two of them have no conflicts or have no report of conflicts or hostilities, external or internal. Which two are they? Sardis and Laodicea. Yeah, very good, Sheila. Sardis and Laodicea are the two churches, when you read through it, there's no report of hostilities or conflicts, either external or internal. All the other churches, there's reports of uh, hostilities or conflicts, either internal or external or both. Uh, so why do you think that is? Only Sardis and Laodicea have no report of conflicts or hostilities. What's going on? Oh, well, they, whoa, I don't know what's happening. You're in an echo chamber. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let me try this. Okay, so can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, 
So um, I, I think it was because they, they had they didn't really have any passion or commitment. Um, they were accused of either being lukewarm or um, spiritually dead. So they didn't have anything to fight about. Yes, very good. Very good. If you're interesting, the ones that have no conflicts are the ones that receive no commendation, only rebuke. So let's drill down on that uh, uh, a little bit. Like Sheila said, uh, Sardis is dead or near death. Laodicea uh, is lukewarm. And that doesn't mean somewhat, that, that may uh, not mean the thing that you think it means. Uh, the waters, the cold waters were refreshing. The hot waters were were healthy. They were medicinally uh, um, uh, useful. Sard, I mean, Laodicea, their church was neither. It was neither refreshing, nor was it uh, helpful. It was only uh, nauseating. Uh, so um, Sardis was near death. Laodicea was nauseating. Um, and yet they're the ones that have no conflicts, internal reported conflicts, internal or external. Why do you think that is? Let me, let me start it off by asking um, this question. When you read the other five um, uh, messages, what's the source of the conflicts? What's the source? of uh, the hostilities. For instance, let's just take the first two churches as an example. I'll read it. I'll uh, look at um, verses two and three regarding the church in Ephesus. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. There's, there's an indication of some of the hostilities and conflicts the believers at Ephesus are undergoing. Look at the church at Smyrna, uh, verse nine and and uh, and ten. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days, um, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. So um, what are, and, and, and we can go on and on and on. Um, in, in, in Pergamum, verse 13, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. So where are the hostilities and conflicts coming for these churches? Well, they're being um, attacked from outside because they're standing on the word and they're speaking truth, or they're having disagreements internally because the church is standing on the word and speaking the truth, but there are those who don't want to hold to it or abide to it. Yeah, precisely. Uh, external threat are from 
from uh, the communities that they're in, the culture that they're in. They're in an idolatrous culture, especially in Asia Minor, which, which is very uh, uh, taken with emperor worship. And plus they have a lot of other uh, um, uh, pagan deities. And remember, we talked about how um, if you were going to get work and support your family, uh, you were going to have to go through the trade guilds. They're like trade unions. And, and the trade guilds were steeped in pagan idol worship and in emperor worship. And so to do business in and through the trade unions, it was going to expose you to all of that uh, idol worship, all of that, all of the pagan ceremonies and feasts, and then the emperor worship and all of that. And the officials in the trade guilds took note if you didn't participate. So that's where a lot of the hostilities and conflicts are, are coming from, is either the, the pagan communities around them or the Jewish communities around them. We saw that in Smyrna. We saw that in Pergamum. Um, uh, the Jewish communities of, in, in, uh, in the message to Smyrna, um, Christ refers to the, to the Jewish community there as the synagogue of Satan. Um, so they're getting, they're getting um, the hostilities and conflicts are coming from either the Jewish community or the pagan culture around them. Because as Sheila pointed out, they are remaining faithful to uh, the gospel. Um, and as Sheila also pointed out, internal conflicts are coming because there's people in those churches that uh, are not wanting uh, to um, uh, stay faithful to the gospel. They're wanting to indulge in some of the pagan practices around and justify it and, and all of, and there's false teachers that have risen up in some of those churches. And part of the problem evidently is the leaders aren't, uh, of those churches aren't um, sanctioning those false teachers the way they should be. Um, so that's the, the conflicts are coming even, either from, from pagan or Jewish opposition external to the church or unfaithful um, professors of Christ within the church. And, uh, but when you read the description of Sardis and Laodicea, are they concerned for remaining faithful to the gospel? And we're here, we're talking about that, about the church as a whole. We're talking about something that characterizes the whole church. No, Sardis is all image and no reality. They're near death. Evidently, they're not totally dead. Because if you read, and uh, because we'll see when we get to Sardis, uh, Christ tells them to strengthen what remains. So evidently, there's something that's still there, but they're near death. Laodicea, Laodicea is just fat, um, fat and comfy in the culture. So there's, uh, by their unfaithfulness and the church as a whole, they have removed themselves from a position of facing hostility from the opposition, from the pagan and Jewish opposition. Does that make sense? So what does that tell us? I just want to 
work my nine to five, go home, you know, have comfortable life, uh, read my Bible, go to church, um, get together with my Christian friends. Uh, I don't want bad things happening to me. Um, is, is that a formula for remaining faithful to Christ? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you speak up? Hello? Yes. Okay. So, um, since we know the truth, I was thinking, since globally the church is shut down, um, I think it's really important that we start inviting people to church, you know, because there's so not only just the church, there's so many people out there that don't know where to go or don't even know that you can go to church, but the, you know, the um, fields are ripe for harvest and um, like we have those cards in the back of the church that say you're invited. And I was just driving over here thinking, you know, it's so easy like to go knock on doors. And I was reading something, um, it might have been in my book um, by Spurgeon on spiritual warfare and prayer. And he was talking about how this guy walked for hours to get to his church. And he thought, well, I'll just place, you know, an invitation in all these people's mailboxes on the way and just make up, you know, for the time that I'm spending. And um, anyway, so we do know the truth, but there's a lot of people that can find the truth. White. If we tell them. Uh, some people, some people uh, uh, like going door to door and knocking and, and talking to people. Many others uh, have opportunities with the people they rub shoulders with, either at work or in the neighborhood or whatever. But yes. Inviting people to church is good. Yeah. Yes, the church still opens its doors. <laughs> um, well, there's one other observation I want to make about these messages uh, before we uh, move on to each individual message. And uh, I've explained it on page three of of your notes, um, uh, I think the, the primary reason for the way that the, that the letters are, are organized, Ephesus through Laodicea is geographical. Because if you look at a map, it follows, it follows a regular mail route. Uh, uh, however, John gives us a couple of clues embedded in here that, that tells us geography is not the only thing at play in the way that these messages are distributed, the way these messages are arranged. And uh, I, I think there's a, a couple of important uh, items here for us to catch. Um, and, and that is uh, when, you, when you look at the elements in each of these messages, those seven elements, um, one of the big things that jumps out, everybody comments on. When you start studying those two chapters, everybody com comments on it. It's one of the big things that jumps out is that uh, these first three messages, um, the last, uh, the next to the last element is a promise to the conqueror. And then the last element is let him I mean, uh, the next to last, I got that switch. The next to last element is he who has near, let him hear what he, what the spirit says to the uh, churches. 
and then um, you know I'm beginning to think I got this backwards anyway halfway through he switches it when he gets it gets to Thyatira see um, let's see I really did carefully put this together. Um, yes, that's right. Um, uh, the the sixth element is um, uh, the call to listen. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the last element is the promise to the conqueror. And he does it that way in the message to Ephesus, to Smyrna, and Pergamon. All of a sudden, when he gets to Thyatira, he switches those two. It's first the promise to the conqueror and then the call to listen. And he keeps that, keeps it that way through the rest of the messages. And so everybody's saying, wow, look, look how he switches these things. That has, that has the effect of making uh, Thyatira the hinge, right? When he gets to the center message, Thyatira, he changes those two orders. And the first readers would have picked up on that. Um, that's one clue that John, that's one signal that John sends us that tells us it's not all geography in the way that I've arranged these messages. It's primarily geography, but it's not all geography. The next clue is um, the the letter to the two churches that received only commendation and no rebuke, those two letters are the next to first and next to last. So they're parallel, you know, number, number two and number six, they're parallel. And that would jump out at people. Uh, I don't wanna make this overly complicated, but when you look at those two things, uh, Thyatira being the center and the hinge because he switches those last two elements, uh, then what, what you have is you have three sets of messages on either side of Thyatira. And the center message of each, the first set is Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, Pergamum. The second set is Sardis, uh, Philadelphia, Laodicea. The center message in each of those sets are the two churches that received only commendation and no rebuke. So what he's doing is he's highlighting those. And by highlighting uh, uh, Smyrna and Philadelphia, he's telling all of the churches, this is what I expect from my churches, faithfulness. Okay. But I thought it'd be interesting for us to kick around. Why do you think he made Thyatira the center church? Look, look what I've got written uh, in, in the notes. Um, 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 at the bottom of page three, I, I say, um, but he that is Christ. Remember, Christ is the one that chose the order. We got that. From verse 11 of chapter 1, he said, John, write these things, write these visions down, send them in a letter to the seven churches, and then Christ stipulated the churches. And that's the order in which we haven't found. So uh, Christ also has a reason for choosing Thyatira as the hinge. Thyatira is the least significant city of the seven. Now, when I say least significant, I don't mean that it's it was just two houses and a post office, and that's it, okay? Thyatira had some stuff to it, a library, gymnasium, and that sort of thing. But the first, first three, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, they were the big three in Asia Minor. Uh, um, uh, Ephesus was, size-wise, was number four in the entire Roman Empire. Pergamum was number five. Uh, Pergamum was the first capital of Asia Minor, but then Augustus, the 
guy that was emperor during uh, at the time of the birth of Christ, he made Ephesus capital of Asia Minor. And Smyrna has some real colorful background we'll, we'll look at next week. Um, those are the big three. Um, Sardis is a famous city. Laodicea is a very wealthy city, very wealthy city. Philadelphia sits on um, a fault line and it had trouble with earthquakes and uh, Caesar invested a lot of money in Philadelphia to, to renovate it and all that. So much so that, that uh, the people of Philadelphia renamed the city Neo Caesarea, New Caesar, New City of Caesar. Um, uh, but Thyatira, it's the smallest. It doesn't, it doesn't have um, the uh, background that the other six churches, have, the other six cities have. But they got by far the longest message from Christ. So he's put them, Christ put them in the middle of the seven. He's made them the hinge church and he sent them the longest letter by far. And yet they're the least significant church. And most commentators will make the comment of uh, Thyatira having the longest letter, 222 words uh, in the Greek, and yet it doesn't seem to warrant it as far as the significance of the city. And then they'll just go on from that. But, oh, thank you. But um, I want to ask us, why do you think that is? Look at those three questions on page four. Christ's purpose in highlighting Smyrna and Philadelphia the way that he did is obvious. They were the two that were received commendation only, no rebuke. He was highlighting their faithfulness. But what do you think uh, his purpose is in highlighting Thyatira? And what does that mean for us? Let me... Oh. So so i have to turn mine on when yours is one of us um, can you hear me That's good. <laughs> so i'm sorry about the confusion with the microphones here um I, I, when I was reading this, I think it's because, and I'm not going to say this right, it's going to come out all wrong, but okay, I'll try to make sure what I'm trying to say. I think because it is probably the most um, common occurrence. Um, I think, you know, Thyatira was a church that had um, all these great things about it, right? Love, faith, service, perseverance, but they were tolerating um, huge sin in the church. It talks about Jezebel, and um, they weren't um, they weren't addressing it. They weren't they weren't protecting the sheep, ensuring that that kind of stuff didn't get into the flock. Um, and I think that's something that we all have to be aware of. And I, I think it's a warning. That's very much true. However, that's the well, uh, with uh, Ephesus and Sardis and Laodicea, because the things that Christ has against those churches would also implicate the leadership and the church not dealing with those things. But can you think of something that's true of Thyatira that would be unique that they wouldn't have in common with the others? Something that I just explained a little bit ago. How about the fact that it's the least significant church? 
of the seven. And yet it got the longest letter or longest message. Do you think maybe there's, uh, there's something that Christ is saying that he's hinting at? Or maybe even saying it louder than a hint? How about he's concerned? Uh, how about the fact that all churches are significant to him? It doesn't matter your size. doesn't matter how impressive or unimpressive your program is. No matter how small or poor your church is, it is significant to Christ that all of his churches remain faithful to him. Wrote that um, that our faith and our action in our love for other must stand out. It has to stand out. Yeah, it does. So Julie said she wrote our our love and what else did you say? I said our faith, action, and love for others must stand out as different from things of the world. Yeah, she said uh, she's keyed in uh, on the on the things that were present in Thyatira, the love, uh, faith, and and action toward others that they have to stand out. But you can imagine if you're a church and you've got these towering giants around you, like Ephesus, uh, the mother of the churches in Asia Minor. And, and Pergamum, uh, and those giant churches, you think, you know, I'm insignificant. I don't really count. I think what Christ, I think the reason he, he uh, uh, highlighted Thyatira in this way is to let us know every church counts. No church is insignificant to me. I need all my churches to be faithful. You are all part of the testimony of Christ to a, a watching and dying world. Does that make sense? It's now, good for us to hear because we're the only insignificant. Yes. Did you hear Pam? She said that's good for GBF to hear because we're little and insignificant. Um, that might bruise the ego a bit, but probably not. We already knew that. <laughs> uh, um, yes, so um, any other comments about that? That just speaks to kind of what I was going back to, like our work in the Lord and what Pastor Wade was preaching on this morning, right? If if all of us were hands, where would the hearing be or something? Because sometimes we think, if I, you know, um, if the, I'm just doing this, you know, how significant is that to God? And if I met, if I miss that opportunity for service, like, it's just a little thing. But this is so beautiful, who our Savior is, that he... Um, it's significant to him. I, if you've heard of Jill Briscoe, she's a, a missionary of old. <laughs> I think she's like in her 80s now, she and her husband. And she was saying how she was very tempted to just move on and start doing the grandkid thing. And she was so overwhelmed with the conviction of who is going, she said, the Holy Spirit said to her, who is going to carry your cross? And that God has a cross for all of us to carry. And um, we need to keep carrying our cross. And this is so beautiful, this lesson that you're bringing up right now, that our work for the Lord is significant. Any other comments or questions? Mike, I, I was thinking in light of, of Dennis Johnson's letter that you wrote, it, it's it's so true that the minority 
of the faithful within churches and the minority of the faithful churches, I think uh, the overwhelming majority is described by Johnson. And, yeah, and small and struggling. I was thinking we're on the West Coast, so I was going to ask you, GBF, what what should we we certainly should be looking out for all of these admonitions. Yes, but it just struck me. You know, West Coast is the bastion of of Laodiceans. Yeah, <laughs> and it's it's really sobering. Yeah. It is. It's very sobering. Well, I just, you know, because those two things jumped out just the way he arranged the messages, I wanted us to look at them and, and think about them, uh, highlighting what he expects of the churches, faithfulness, highlighting Sm the faithfulness of Smyrna and Philadelphia, and then highlighting Thyatira in the sense, uh, in 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 uh, um, uh, in order to tell us that uh, all churches are significant, even the small struggling ones on the west coast, in the midst of a uh, a culture that ignores and despises them. Uh, make no. Uh, 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 and there's no doubt about it that um, the church nowadays in 21st century America, we're, we're not only on the fringe of the community, we tend to be on the lunatic fringe of yeah. the community. That's the way we're viewed. And, uh, and it is significant to Jesus that we remain faithful, just like those churches in Smyrna and Philadelphia. Now these second two questions we'll, we'll uh, answer, we'll dispatch with next week before we dive into Ephesus and Smyrna next week. So any other questions? When you said that, I was thinking about Wes's message. Didn't he say that the, the foolish, they, the people would come in there and view this message and said, these, guy, these guys are nuts. Yeah, you know yeah. something like that. So maybe that would be something we would champion being appropriately nuts spiritually speaking. That's right, exactly. He encourages us to do that. Uh, I remember Russell Moore in his book uh, Onward uh, in the introduction. He was talking about an interview he had with this one. Uh, uh, professor at an elite school because of a project that she was working on. She was really interested in his viewpoint on this certain thing because she just thought it was really strange. And he told her, oh, I, I believe in stranger things than that. <laughs> he says, I believe that a dead man is coming back on a horse and is going to <laughs> set up his kingdom on the earth. <laughs> yeah. So... Yes. Okay. Well, let's let's close it down there, and we'll take up uh, next week. Um, uh, Philip, would you like to close us in prayer? Yeah. Father, the richness of your word is I just remarkably impressed with that as I listened to Mike teach through these passages and. We, we can read over them really quickly and think, well, that has nothing to do with our church or, uh, or me, but it has everything to do with us. And we, uh, it leads us to pray for faithfulness on our part individually and, um, you know, the leadership and as a church to uh, take these things and we can learn from it. Thank you for this teaching. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.